Welcome to the Business Trendsetter Podcast, where we talk about trends and how to use them to grow your business. My name is Manny Turan. And I'm Adam Hartone. We're here every week to discuss how to grow your business, understanding trends, understanding the dynamics of business growth. And if you uh, think about business growth, the single element that defines what that is, is revenue. And I had a recent conversation with somebody that happened to be a government worker about what's the quote unquote best kind of money. And this person said to me that the best for them in their mind, the best kind of money is grant money because you don't have to pay it back. And I thought to myself, mm, not so much. I think it's, it's definitely customer money because if you've got customer money, it means you have a market. It means that people are going to buy your product or service over and over again. And so, Adam, let's hear from you regarding why and, and how why and how important revenues are for uh, growing your business. Well, there was a study that was done uh, back uh, in the 1990s, going into the to the new century by MIT, and I, I, I've been trying to find the study. I've been trying now for about seven or eight months to find it because people have been some people asked me if I could get it for them. And unfortunately, I, I've hunted and hunted. I've called colleagues, but the, I, I'm struggling. So, folks, I apologize. I can't give you the name of the study right now. I'm still trying to find it. But anyway, MIT got a government grant, and they raised quite a bit of money. And my, my recollection, it was they raised something like you know, $50 million to try to be, create a model to predict the success of an entrepreneurial venture and uh, then and businesses as they launch things. And they so they fed all the public data in that they could get all the private data and revenue and costs. And then they went and got leadership information. Where did the people go to school? What was their background? Were they in the industry? Were they in a different industry? Did people change industries? They got all kinds of information about regulations and taxes. And they, they built this huge model, only, only a university with a lot of money could do. And uh, after three years, they had to post the results, and they did. And they came back and they said that they ran these correlations against all these different factors trying to understand what would make a business successful. And they, they tried to say, you know, was it, was it leadership being very well educated or was it um, having a lot of patents and trademarks and all, mm -hmm. all these different factors. And they said when they got done, there was only one variable that was any good at predicting success. So there were a lot of a lot of variables, hundreds of variables they looked at. None of them had a, 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 a really had a predictable uh, score to it. But the one variable that predicted success was revenues. People who sold more stuff were more successful. <laughs> and I think the reason I'm having trouble finding the study is because it was such an obvious answer. And they were a little embarrassed about, you know, hey, we spent all this money and this is what we got out of it. It was something that most people would probably sit there and think about for a while and say, that's probably true. You know, if people are buying your stuff, you're doing good. If they're not buying your stuff, you're obviously not doing so good and you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Yet we, we tend to forget about that. We get all wrapped up in our business. We get all wrapped up in talking about politics and everything that goes on. Then we start to forget the fact that the m most important thing we have is our revenue stream, that the right. revenue stream is telling us if we're successful or not. If customers are turning you down, if customers are buying less stuff, if the prices are falling through the floor and your volumes aren't going up enough to make a difference so that you can keep growing, then it's telling you the world is moving. Yeah. Where's it going? But it's wherever it's going, it's going without you. If exactly. your revenues aren't going up, it's going without you. And you're like the guy that was working in the livery stable, pounding away on that anvil, making another horseshoe while he watched the next Model T drive by out front. And he said, exactly. they're saying, well, I don't know about this thing, you know, is this going to really matter? <laughs> and, yeah. and he kept pounding away on that anvil until there just wasn't a need for the guy anymore. And, but, and that's where I think we get stuck a lot, is to remember that just, it, it's so simple, but are you able to sell more stuff? Are you able right. to keep those revenues up and growing? One of the things that, you know, you and I met because of Vistage, I was a member, you were a speaker, and uh, I think it's a great organization. And I think there's lots of other similar organizations that have a lot to say. And there's always conversations about HR or conversations about building a, uh, your culture and these things. And they're all great. They're all, they all have a, a good place in your business, but if they're not really there in process and, you know, in the, in the whole process to build revenue, then what's the point? And I'm not saying that you've got to be a mercenary company that just, you know, uh, rapes and pillage, so to speak, but it's got to be something that if you do something for your business, at the end of the day, it should increase and improve your, uh, your revenue generation ability and your revenue. Yeah. I mean, quite simply, you know, 
if you think about Amazon, Amazon wouldn't be the company it is if it would, if it had remained just kept selling books, right? It had to keep trying to do new stuff, and as it tried to do new stuff and succeeded, it tried to do more new stuff and get to do more new stuff. So you end up with this behemoth of a company that's selling all these products and selling all these services and selling now cloud services and, and tech services, right? And they kind of keep going forward. They you know they tried to make and sell um, their own phone that, that flopped, right? So it didn't work out, but they kept going, right? They, they didn't let a failure here they're getting their way so they it's it's that interaction with the customer like you said is so important because you, you should be listening to customers not just okay how do i sell you more of what i have but listen to what their needs are and what they're saying is happening in the world and what's going on with them and what they think they're likely to do different next year you know new technologies new regulations new uh, opportunities what are they saying they're, where are they headed what is it they want you know apple when Apple was nearly dead and Steve Jobs came back to run the company again, and it, he didn't just say, hey, we got to go sell more Macintoshes. He said, that game's already over. Like, the PC business has been won, and Microsoft's out front, and you got Dell and HP and all these people making boxes. He says, what we got to do is figure out what people want and give it to them. And, he, and they, their results was, they said, people really wanted to take technology mobile. But the old-fashioned box that we had, the computer PC box with a big monitor and display, you know, a cathode ray tube in the old days, that that technology wasn't mobile. You couldn't throw that in the car and take it with you. And he said, how do we drive towards mobility? And with that statement, he said, what do we got to go do? You know, and they, they came out with the iPod, right, yeah, which was mm -hmm. this pretty inexpensive product, but it relaunched the company down the road to mobile. And, you know, of course, today the iPhone has become this wildly successful product. But what did they do? He started saying, what do people want? And it wasn't, how do I make a better Mac? Because they wanted to be mobile. And so he started coming up with devices that help people get mobile. And, and, and if you think about it, Apple was a computer company. Sony should have made that product because Sony had right. the Walkman and the Discman mm -hmm. and all that technology, right? And you would have thought they'd have sat back and said, hey, we're already making people mobile with their entertainment. How would we make it even better? And they could have digitized the music gotten it off the CD-ROMs, moved down that road to sell more stuff. But they were locked up because they were so excited about, they had they bought a music company, right? And so Sony Music was selling CD-ROMs at the time for 18 bucks a crack. Right. And uh, they didn't want to start giving away songs at a dollar a piece on some no. kind of a site. So, it, you know, they, they, they missed that market because they kept trying to sell what they already had rather than saying, hey, how do, where do the customers want to go? And, and can we help them get there? You know, they, we see this over and over where people in companies have the customers, have the relationships, but they don't ask the customer what they really want. And therefore, they let a competitor come in and take it away from them. Right. They let somebody else come in with a new right. technology, a new way of solving the customer problem, and they, they lose their market. And if they just paid attention to revenues early on, they'd say, hey, how can I keep growing my revenues and how do I listen better to my customer? Yeah, I think the the idea of, of just simply asking your customer what they want isn't necessarily the best way either. This is why you and I talk about trends, why they're so important. Right. You know, we, we've we've used this example in the past, and I'll kind of reference your previous uh, you know Model T discussion of what Henry Ford said. And I'm going to paraphrase: If I would have asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Yeah. And I think the genius of Steve Jobs was that he was able to see beyond what the customer could see taking in consideration what their true needs are, like you said, mobile, but then looking at the landscape of what's happening with trends and then put those together to create a, a product that has really revolutionized the way we, we live today. Well, let's take a look at what's happened to retail, right? 20 years ago, Sears was a really viable, large hundred year old company. You know, you still had, I think 20 years ago, my son Montgomery Ward's around. We certainly had Toys R Us around at that time and Radio Shack. And, all of those companies that were successful, they were out there with their stores, and they were selling things. But whenever the new technology came along that allowed people to start buying stuff over the Internet and birthed this whole thing we call electronic commerce, these guys didn't see that as an opportunity to sell more stuff. Instead, they started saying, well, maybe I'll use some of that Internet technology in my purchasing operations or I'll use that Internet technology uh, with my inventory management control systems across multiple stores. I'll use this technology on uh, my ability to uh, see, uh, hire and staff my stores. But the obvious thing here was, well, maybe you should use that technology to help the customer buy more stuff. And then they could have invested in that. Well, you know, Toys R Us is gone today. Uh, Radio Shack's gone today. Sears is gone today. 
Walmart is not doing well, right? And even though they went and bought Jet, they're still not doing well because they don't see these things as ways to keep growing their revenues. If they were sitting there saying, hey, all I got to do is grow revenues, then you would obviously start to get rid of your assets. Now, when I started taking finance, one of the first rules of finance was sunk costs do not matter. And they would try to drum it into your head. Look, if you've spent the money, it's gone. Now, you know, we can depreciate it and we can do all kinds of things in accounting. But when you're making financial decisions, sunk costs don't matter. You have to say, where do I put my next dollar, my next hundred dollars, my next thousand dollars to get my greatest rate of return? So if I put a million dollars into a lousy stock, it doesn't matter if it's still a lousy company that's not going forward. It's been, you know, if you put a million dollars into Sears and you see Sears is not going after electronic commerce, it doesn't matter that you have a million there. Your, net, your money needs to go someplace else. But what I see in business all the time is people get invested. They get money invested and emotionally invested in their business. And they start saying, oh, I've got this store. I built this store. I have to protect the store. I have to get customers into my store. Instead of saying that's a sunk cost, and if people want to come to my store, I need to just forget about it and move on. They keep trying to protect it. And they try to protect their fellow co-workers, right, on the job. Yeah. And they try to protect their technology from advances and alternative technologies to substitute products. And so even though the first rule of finance is sunk costs do not matter, most businesses are run as if sunk costs are the most important thing. Or right. we already historically invested rather than saying, I need to invest where the customer's going. You said a word a second ago that I, th I think really needs to be shouted out and, and really thrown out into the, the light is that a lot of people in business leadership positions make decisions based on emotion. And I think emotion is, is great if you're reading a book or if you're with your, your partner or whatever, uh, I think there's a place for that, but in business, and it's hard to remove yourself from emotion. Believe me, I've been there. You've been there having to make these decisions about firing somebody or closing down a division or closing down a business. It's not an easy decision to make. But you've got to look at that first rule of finance, like you said. You can't go after that uh, the dead dollar. You got to go after the the live dollar. Yeah, every time. I mean, I made a one time. I hired a sales guy. I was at the Dupont Company at the time, and we were launching off a new product, which was sold into the Macintosh marketplace. Back when Macintoshes looked like a PC, you know, we had what was called a new bus architecture in it. Anyway, and we had some add-in cards and things that we had developed for people to do uh, better graphic image processing and image handling. And I hired some get the sales force put together. And I remember I was trying to get this guy hired that was going to work in the Bay Area, which is the toughest place, most competition, but at the same time, biggest opportunity. And uh, and so it's costly. Well, get this guy hired. And I said, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get these sales going. And here's your list of customers. I want you to get after this. And so after 30 days, I had a meeting with him. And I said, you know, I don't see anything in the reports that you sold anything yet. He said, oh, no. He said, I've been busy setting up my office. I said, what? He said, yeah, you know, there's an office in Santa Clara, and I went in there and talked to the guy, and I'm setting my office up. I said, how many sales calls have you made in the last 30 days? The answer was zero. I fired him on the spot. I fired him. I said, look, you're obviously the wrong guy because we need people that are out there selling. And we had a customer list. We had a product. We need to make this go. My boss went back. He was like, you can't fire somebody after 30 days. That looks bad. It looks like you made a hiring mistake. I said, I didn't make a hiring mistake. He looked good on paper. His references were good. But it turns out he was more of a sit in the office guy than he was get out and make it happen guy. And that's not going to work for us right now. we got to get people out there on the streets. But my boss was just so upset about the optics of what it looked like that he was willing to sit there and say, wait a minute, let this guy fail for three more months so the optics look good. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, if this guy doesn't get these sales going, then we're, not, we're going to lose our backing from the corporation and we're not going to be able, they'll just drop the whole product line. You know, we'll, we'll be a one year, one hit failure. And, and But people, like I said, you got to get divorced from that emotion. You got to get divorced from that optics of the decision yeah. and start saying, really, what do I have to do if I want to be successful here? Um, yeah, the, that word optics, by the way, that word optics is uh, definitely a, a different way of saying emotion. <laughs> but there, especially now in this day and age, I, we could probably spend a whole podcast talking about how companies are making these decisions that don't reflect the, the, the revenue chasing mantra in an effort because they don't want to look bad or they want to sort of settle into the whole woke mindset. Now, there's a place for that. We've talked about this in the past. But I think people have a tendency to take it to extremes. And I've got a lot of friends that own businesses that are that are sort of playing this game right now of how how much do I give to the 
this the, the one single loud voice versus all of the other voices that are that are at my uh, my doorstep. Yeah, uh, the story I like to tell. I like to talk about older companies sometimes because of the fact that they're stories that people can easily understand, and it reflects that these notions we're talking about aren't brand new notions. They've been around for a long time and been proven over time. So, long time ago. Every house in America had a sewing machine in it. It was just the norm of the time. And in fact, almost every school, high school, had a class called home economics, which was supposed to be taken by women, not men, and where they learned the fine art of sewing and other things for the house. And this goes back now, and we're talking, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. And uh, at that time, Singer made sewing machines. They were the number one sewing machine. A guy named Singer had invented the needle where the thread was at the bottom of the needle instead of the top and made sewing machine work. Very successful. But what happened was the machines were, were built to last forever. People buy a Singer sewing machine and it could run for 10, 15 years. It had metal gears in it. Very, very reliable product. But in Japan, they started taking and making the machine out of a, a, a different a plastic, a hard molded plastic. It wasn't going to last as long as the Singer machine. But they put electronics in it. And they started making it possible for the machine to do more and the operator to do less. And a couple of other things, they figured out how to put people's initials. You could put in the initial in the machine and it would make the initials on somebody's cuff or somebody's collar. This was very, very fancy for 1970s. People couldn't do that. You would have to go to a, somebody in a special specialty store in order to have those, some of those things done. And some of the different kinds of patterns of, of, the, of the sewing that they would do. So anyway, this was... You know, kind of this brother was the brand name that was coming out of Japan. It was doing better and better. And, and the, the senior leader, the CEO of Singer, called in his executives one day and he had the Singer sewing machine and he had this brother sewing machine. The Singer sewing machine at the time was selling for something like $600. The brother sewing machine was selling for something like $150. Okay. And so he sits there and says, let's look at the comparison of these two products. And the, the, the brother sewing machine definitely did lots, lots more it wouldn't last as long, okay? It was gonna wear out quicker. So if you ran a sewing machine six, seven hours a day, which some people did, then this machine would wear out in a year. And he said, so what are we gonna do? And the whole executive team said, we are way ahead. And he looked at him and he says, no, we've lost. We've already lost. We cannot catch that electronic technology. We have nothing there. We've not started down that road. We, we could take their machine apart, but we're going to find patents and other uh, technology requirements that are in there that we won't be able to beat. They got ahead of us on this. And so he literally, this is not a joke, he went to his investment banker and he said, call up the company that owns bro this brother brand and tell them they can buy the whole of Singer. And he negotiated a deal to sell the entire company, brand name and everything, to brother, and they concluded the transaction in 30 days. And then what he had was he had a senior leadership team and himself and a big pot of money, but he had no company, right? And it was brilliant because that forced right. them to go figure out what they wanted to do. And they spent a, a couple of years with what they ended up doing. And by the way, people wanted, there's a whole chapter of my book that I wrote, you know, two decades, a decade and a half ago about how this, about the story, it's all captured in there. But the net of it is that they, uh, they looked at what had happened in the Reagan revolution, lots more money going to military spending. They said, wow, this could be a great market. The best place to be in military spending was in aircraft. And the best place to be in aircraft was in electronics for the cockpit. And so that's what they did. They invested all their money in that and became wildly successful, much more profitable. And eventually they were bought by General Dynamics and everybody made a huge amount of money. What I'm telling you here is once he recognized that this brother sewing machine was selling quickly and his sales of singer sewing machines were not, that his sales were stagnating, he realized the competition was going to catch him. When he realized that, he got out of the business. He gave them the brand new gear so that he could capture as much value as possible before the business dwindled into nothingness, before it became a Sears or a Toys R Us and went into nothingness. He captured that value. And then what he did was he didn't limit himself in any way when he looked for the next big thing where he wanted to take the company. And that's really, as, an, as entrepreneurs, the way we need to think. It's all about how we're going to try to grow the revenues of the company, even if they have nothing to do with the revenues that we have today. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, a lot of these companies that are successful today. You mentioned one of them earlier is Amazon, is uh, is purely driven on uh, on revenue, right? They they try something out, it doesn't work, they rinse and they rinse and repeat. They get rid of that, they move forward. They maybe put it on the shelf, maybe put it on ice. You know, the whole idea of that store where you just walk in and grab whatever you want and walk out, and everything is RFID tagged. And I mean, they've tried lots of things and. 
they keep on trying. You know, we've talked about uh, blank space in the past, and there's a, a, me a method to do this successfully, but there's no emotion. And some people might th think, well, that's not the way I want to do business. Well, do you want to be in business for the long term, or do you want to just be in business for um, you know the next quarter, the next year, until somebody else eats your lunch? So one of the things that I always tell groups when I'm doing presentations is that over time, you, your revenue needs to grow 10% per year. And for a lot of small businesses, that seems to people like it's a really big number to try to hit. But the reality is, is that if you don't grow 10% per year, you're not sustainable. The economy overall grows at about 2 to 3% per year. I mean, just listen to what your own pal and all the people in the newspaper are saying, you know, Larry Sanders, all the people. And it... That, so you got to grow at two and a half, three percent to keep up with the economy. But on top of economic growth, you have inflation, which historically is about two and a half to three percent. So we're trying to get to again. So what does that tell you? I got to have five points of growth just to keep up with the economy. Otherwise, you're the guy pounding the anvil, watching the money go to the to the, to the guy driving the cars. You got to keep up with the economy. So imagine the economy is a big balloon, and you're a little balloon inside the big balloon. As the big balloon expands, you've got to proportionally expand if you want to be sustainable. If you want to grow. So the big balloon is growing at 5%, so you got to get 5% just to be part of the balloon and not be losing place. But on top of that, stuff wears out in business. You know, you've got to replace your anvil. you got to replace your hammer. you got to replace your computer. you got to replace your assets. you got to invest in new technologies that make the old, when the old technology starts to become obsolete. So you, you can't keep doing your payroll on paper. you got to start to buy new computers and software and things that allow you to keep up, right? So you have to invest in the basics of your business as new technologies come along. People leave. You have to replace them. That requires training. It requires hiring costs and training costs to get people up to speed. And so what we now know is you've got to grow your business at about four points a year to replace the dying part of it. So a lot of people sit there and say, hey, Joyce has worked for me for 20 years and Jim has worked for me for 15 years. And you're not thinking of this. I don't have that turnover. Well, Joyce and Jim could leave in the same week. Right. The reality is you've got to be prepared to replace your assets. And if you're looking around and your assets are getting old, the tables are getting worn out, chairs are getting worn out. It's telling you you've been under investing in your assets, maybe under invested in your brand. A lot of people don't spend on advertising. Brand looks really good, but over time it gets chipped away because other people do things to make their brand bigger and your brand gets smaller. So you've got to invest in advertising. Again, that all gets you to four points. So you got to have five points to keep up with the basic economy and four points to keep your business alive. And you haven't given yourself anything yet. Your investors have got nothing. So you got to have one point of growth just to have some money for the investors at the end of the day. So that takes 10 points, 10 points of revenue growth yeah. just to be consistently sustainable. Now, if you want to pay big bonuses, if you want to put money, you know, give people opportunities to take time off, you want to take everybody out for parties and things like that, you got to be better than 10 points. And the good news is if you get up 11, 12, you probably have that. And if you're doing 15, 16, you got a great business. you got a great business. And that's why if we look at companies like Google and Amazon, or not Amazon, not Google, Apple, Netflix, where you hear about people doing things like having a masseuse in the building and people playing and having ping pong and, and people having free sushi and those stories, those are all these high revenue growth companies. Why? Because the cash is flowing in. The customers are buying more and the more they buy, the more the cash flows in. In fact, if we take a look over the last three years, we saw uh, that uh, Facebook or Meta company was growing at a really good rate. And then what happened was there was this big focus on VR, virtual reality, and they took their eye off the ball and they had two consecutive quarters of negative revenue growth. And boom, the stock fell from 300 right. to 80. They got crushed, they got hammered, and everybody was writing them off. Well, somebody got a hold of Jeff Zuckerberg and his team, and they said, guys, I don't, nobody cares about virtual reality as long as you're growing your revenue. But if that's all you're going to talk about and your revenues go down, then you're in big trouble. They turned their heads around. They got refocused back on ad sales. They got quarter after quarter revenue growth, and the stock's back up to $300 now. And this all happened in the course of a couple of years. We turned it around. But that's the point. The point is when you take your eye off the revenue ball, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get kicked. And the more you're in technology games, the harder you're going to get kicked. So you've got to be after it all the time in order to keep your revenue growing up so that you're not getting kicked by the competition and getting kicked out the door by your customers. You need that 10 points at a minimum, but we're really looking for 15 to 16. One of the things that, you know, when we talk to our, our client base that we get some pushback on, and I know you'll relate to this, Adam, because we, we see this day in, day out, is that 
entrepreneurs and business leaders who are successful are blinded by their success. So when you're riding high on that wave, you're, you're shipping out DVDs, your Netflix back in, you know, 15 years ago, and you don't see with the cliff coming, right? You're so successful. You're putting money in your pocket. Your investors are happy. You're having these parties. You're having the misuse come in all that. And so you take your eye off the ball and then you've got that moment where you slip. And, you know, a lot of giants that have, that have slipped, you know, uh, Blockbuster slipped. You mentioned Sears earlier. And there's companies today that are slipping that, you know, even Walmart's slipping. So I think it's important in that domain as well to re remove emotion and to look beyond what is in front of you. What are the trends telling you? What's happening with the customer base? Where are things going? You and I talk about trends all the time because that is the, the, the rushing current of the river that we've used that analogy, uh, where are things going? Rather than being that giant swamp, why not be in a, in a smaller, fast moving river that then expands into a bigger river of revenues? I went on this mission of talking about revenues and, and these stories around 2003. And, and of course I had to put a lot of data together and I wrote the book, Create Marketplace Disruption, which came out in 2007. And at that time I was going around proselytizing to people and I would walk in a room where everybody knew Jim Collins and Jim Collins didn't talk about revenues. He talked about cultural issues like you're talking about. Know your hedgehog concept. Know what you're good at. Be very focused. Do what you do very, very well. If you're very good and you're very focused, everything will work out fine. Of course, nobody knows who Jim Collins is when I go out and give talks now to people under the age of 40 that never heard of the guy. Why? Well, because a lot of companies got real focused on the one thing they knew how to do and then that one thing wasn't important anymore and that's what happened to them, right? They got themselves in a lot of trouble and then went away. But that was, I mean, I fought that battle hard from 2007 up through into the Great Recession. And then in the Great Recession, I'm telling people it's revenues, revenues, revenues. And they're looking at me like, hell no, it's about survivability. I'm not going to take a risk on growing my revenues. I'm going to keep as much money in the bank as I possibly can. You're an idiot, Adam. You can't be doing that. Well, then the recession ended. And when the recession, we work our way out of the recession in 12, 13, and 14, those companies that focused on revenues and not profits, those that said, I'm going to run on a real thin margin, what happened was they'd gathered more customers, they'd launched more products. They were inside that customer's world selling them more stuff. They'd improved their efficiency because as they got revenues to keep growing revenues, they had to figure out better ways to run the business. So they opened up the creativity innovation doors and said, we got to try it because if we don't try it, we won't, make, we won't be able to keep going forward. We got to keep after this. And so what we learned then by the time we got to 13, 14 was that the number one criteria for success through the Great Recession, which was a horrible recession, was revenues. Revenues, again, yeah. make businesses sustainable. If we're this week, first week of October 2023, uh, we've got a lot of the stock market's been terrible in September and it's doing bad this week. And the whole thing is that uh, Treasury yields are at the highest they've been since something like 15, 16 years ago. And now people are much more concerned about a recession than they were two, three months ago. And so all this talk about right. the recession has gone way up. And I want to just bring forward again that if you think that there's going to be a recession, then it is more important than ever that you focus on revenues because you've got to start saying, what do my exactly. customers want? How do I get my customers to sustain me through this? If I try to tell you, I'm going to put some money in the bank and live off of it, then you're already planning for layoffs. You're going to let your best people go. Your best people are going to get demotivated working right. in an environment where you're not growing more stuff. Your, your customers are going to get demotivated because you're not doing things to keep them happy with new products, new solutions, more interactions. The community that you're in is going to get tired of the fact that you're trying to cut costs all the time. And you're not doing anything to help the community during a bad time. So all of these constituencies that you're working with, it's going to be bad if you think you save your way. Nobody ever saved their way to prosperity. You can't save your way through a through a recession and hope to come out in a good spot. No, you still have to invest. You still have to work on those revenues, and it's more important in a recession than any other time. I mean, I guess when economies are good, people saying, "Hey, it's easy to grow revenues." Now the economy is not so good; it's hard to grow revenues. But just because it's hard doesn't mean you don't have to do right. it. You still got to get out there and make it happen. No, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it, if you grow your revenue during a recession. That means that you're working smarter, you're working better, and you're you're going to get uh, more market share at the end of it. You're going to keep your people employed. I mean, there's lots of reasons why building revenue, especially during the you know the fabled R word, is important. And as we ran uh, round up the the tail end of the podcast here, Adam, I wanted to, I brought up something here when you were talking of uh, so uh, the Jim Collins uh, companies that he detailed as the 
good to great poster children. You ready? Mm -hmm. Abbott Labs, Circuit City, Fannie Mae, Gillette, Kimberly Clark, Kroger, Nucor Corp, Philip Morris, Pitney Bowes, Walgreens, and Wells Fargo. Yeah. Some of those are gone completely, and a lot of them are in really bad shape, right? This last week, Walgreens, yeah. which is one of the largest drug retailers in the world, they fired their CEO because they're in so much trouble. Yeah, it uh, quite clearly, quite clearly, you don't want to make it into a Jim Collins list of being really good at focusing on your core. <laughs> That those words are echo in my in my nightmares, Adam, because that was some that is why when you and I met, I was drawn to you like a moth to a flame because I saw my uh, my biggest uh, failure, which in turn was actually my biggest success when I had my company and we were doing extremely well. And then from from one year to the next, everything kind of changed and revenues were down and I had a kind of a unofficial board of directors. And I asked them, what should I do? And these were made up of very good business people that were very well intentioned. Uh, one, one phrase came out above all, focus on your core. <laughs> and I did, and the market had changed. And I was there with the anvil and the, and you know, the hammer and everything else passed me by. And so that was a hard lesson for me to learn. Um, but you know what, we, we get up the next day and we keep on fighting. Keep after those revenues, Manny. Very well said, Adam. We'll talk to you next week. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye.